Hi everyone, my name's Lindsay German. I'm interviewing Jane Shallis today about the uh, theatre director and um, a very famous uh, person who was involved in the theatre going right back to the 1950s, Peter Brook, who died this week. Um, Jane's somebody who's had a lifelong interest in theatre and was involved in the what was then called the kind of alternative theatre group cast in the late 60s. So, Jane, welcome. And uh, perhaps you'd like to say a little bit about what theatre was like um, back in the day and what uh, what changes came about as a result of people like Peter Brook. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, the thing that was always important, I think, for us to realise is that when we talk about theatre and the last 20, 30 years, Theatre is very different from what it was post-war. Uh, and that's when Brooke started to be involved in theatre. As a child, you went to the theatre very, very occasionally. Everybody always dressed up, something that really irritated me, no end. And you went to something very special, but was one that was also... In many ways, plays were quite deferential, I think, in terms of the relationship to the state. It was, you know, Brattigan. I mean, there was a whole, clearly the classics, you know, you always had Shakespeare and, and Shaw and Ibsen. Uh, and of course, in many of those plays, there were really radical ideas. This was always something that for me was very important about theatre, that in the ideas that you were hearing and watching being portrayed on a stage, there were always things of great interest, but there was also a sort of layer of really quite clearly an expectance of deference from an audience and, and, and a form of behavior that you, know, you always felt was, was necessary. However, Brooke, uh, Brooks started, um, he, he was at Oxford uh, in, during the war. Um, he was an immensely, almost precocious young man, not in, in the way he dealt with people necessarily, but his ideas, he, he had a, a huge fervor for both film, photography and for theater, but particularly for theater, and he was, directing things at Oxford, and then amazingly got, part, got uh, direction parts in some of the uh, theatres in the West End. And at the age of 22, got a post as production. Um, I can't remember what the quite title was, but it was a production, maybe a producer at the Royal Opera House. And for three years, this young, very, very young man was actually directing opera. Uh, he was, in the end, uh, removed because he chose to put on Oscar Wilde's uh, Salome. And uh, it was clearly didn't get a good audience in terms of, of the opera going. But from then onwards, all the way through the late 40s and 50s, he was somebody who was clearly rated as a very, very young, very interesting young director with masses of ideas and almost pouring out of him ideas about how, in fact, plays ought to be uh, staged. And one of the things that was always interesting about him was from a very, very early age, he believed the most important thing for a director was to interpret what the author what the playwright wanted. So he was well prepared to jettison bits of the text. He would edit plays down. And that was something he did all his life actually, but he didn't believe that the text itself was the most important thing. What he thought was the most important was the interpretation of what in fact the playwright wanted to pursue. But all the way through this period, he was actually uh, producing Shakespeare plays, you know, Ibsen, I mean, really the classics. And I, be, I the very first play of his that I ever saw was US, which was in the mid sixties. I joined a political theater group or I, I was part of the formation 
of a small theater group, which was based on anti-Vietnam position. We were producing half hour plays that were sort of agit prop plays. And Brooke at the same time had decided that what he wanted to do was to put on US, which is a play that was going to be about the Vietnam War. Now, just prior to then, and something I never saw, but I've seen the film of, and which everybody can look at still on YouTube, was Marassad play, which was a play that was, I think in many ways, an amazing production, because it was about the inhabitants of an asylum in Paris, just after the revolution. And it was a reenactment of the death of Mara in the asylum. And Brooke asked, was searching around for somebody to, to translate and to create more from the Peter Weiss text that he had. And he met Adrian Mitchell. And Adrian produced a lot of the text and many of the songs from it. So that was a sort of another area that I became more and more conscious of Brooke from because I knew Adrian. And then in two or three years later, Adrian again was uh, asked to write songs for US, which was this play. Now, whereas those of us who are on the political left would be making plays that were wanting to be against the Vietnam War, Brooke was almost, I mean, it's a bit strange. He's a bit like a sort of an Olympian. He sort of rose, in, rose above the, the conflict. And he was very taken with the actions of the Buddhist monks who were self-immolating. And he in fact wanted the play that he was putting on on a London stage to portray the death of an American Quaker, who in fact, again, had burnt himself to death uh, against the Vietnam War. So in one way, he was sort of portraying the opposition to the war, but it was almost like removed. He didn't want to say, you know, the war had to stop immediately or anything. But, and it was very odd because the whole play suddenly, when it was performed, most of the, there was clearly a very divided audience. There were some people who in fact were very much uh, in favor of it. I mean, I know all of us went and this is, you know, we were sitting but almost in the front row of the stalls. Uh, waiting for something, you know, really good to happen. But the thing that became the sort of the core celebre of the play was the fact that right at the end, there appeared to be butterflies being burnt by an actor. And uh, it was, I mean, it's a very odd thing, but, but the thing that was interesting about it, as well as the Marisade, was these were not scripted plays. They were based on a lot of improvisation, a lot of work with musicians, with people who in fact were involved in music, a movement. And, and it was, I mean, they were quite substantially different sorts of plays that you'd seen on the West End previously. And I think that what happened with Brooke was that he later became more and more aware through the 60s, and 70s, that what he was wanting to do was to find all, I mean, it sounds um, odd to say it, but it, it, it's almost like, I mean, he, would ne he himself would never say this, but it was almost like trying to find what is the secret of theatre, what is the issue, what is theatre? And for, whereas for me, it's always listening to words on air and knowing this is an experience you have, that is not going to be able to be replicated on film. It is about the actual, the actual performance. He, in fact, was working on almost scientifically attempting with actors and musicians to try and work out what it was that constituted theatre. And he wrote a very important book, I think, for many people in theatre called The Empty Space. What he did was he was, he was working, he, he believed that just if you had an empty space and an actor walked into it and was acting, 
that this is theatre. Mm -hmm. But it isn't just somebody walking through a space. It's somebody has to be attempting to portray something other than themselves. And I think, I mean, that had a huge impact on large numbers of very young people, massive impact. As yeah. well as, of course, on theatre uh, practitioners. I mean, I think, you know, what you're pointing to there as well is that, you know, when you talk about the 1950s theatre, you know, they were very conventional looking. They had proscenium marches, all the seating was in rows, which, of course, lots of theatre still is. But even now, quite mainstream theatre experiments much more with space and experiments much more with using music is a big part of of many many plays now not just musicals but things where music is actually tied into the action and tied into into what is happening and that must have been a big change from the conventional theatre and obviously wasn't liked by a whole number of people connected to the theatre and also presumably to quite a number of the audiences who tended to be very middle class and I think one of the things that theatre then did was to open up to a wider audience and and you know that seems to me I know um if you think about the 60s places like the roundhouse in London were very important for doing some of those things the royal court had very radical writing and, and production of of plays that were mm. quite different from what a lot of people had, had said and of course it also coincided with the uh, abolition of censorship in the in the theatre so how do you think those things fed into the politics really because it, it seems to me they must have had a big effect on how actors and directors and everybody connected with the stage really saw themselves and saw what they were doing well I, I think I think I mean you're right that that the the conventional theatre was with the proscenium march and the fourth wall so that everybody performed as though there's no audience. The thing that was interesting about both Mara Saad and about US was that they were directed straight at the audience. You ended up like Joan Littlewood with all her work. It became something you felt that they were quite giants in terms of their view about what theater was about, which was addressing audiences and then attempting, more Joan Littlewood attempting to ensure that, in fact, it was speaking to ordinary people. But in a funny way, even Brooke felt that. And he something he said about directing a play that had a crowd in it of Russian peasants. And he said, they are not just stereotypes. All of these are sort of individuals. And people have to see them as poor people, people who, in fact, may have been lost their houses or whatever. It's, it's an attempt to sort of say that the audience has to recognize people on stage in the way that in fact is not something that is, you know, a sort of museum piece. So I think, I mean, I think the changes that occurred and there were things, and you're absolutely right to talk about the Royal Court because it was that theater that ensured that working class uh, writers would be putting plays on, giving huge support to a whole layer of people who in fact became important playwrights. Uh, and, and of course for, uh, for actors as well, their, their relationship to productions was often collaborative or feeding into the ideas of a director rather than just being the pawns on a stage that are being moved around. And those were hugely important. But the other thing that was happening, and you're right, the Lord Chamberlain uh, was abolished, the, the body of, of censorship, which operated in the most amazing ways. I mean, there was a case in somewhere like Runcorn or somewhere, where an amateur company had put on a play by an American lefty. I think it was Waiting for Lefty that they put on. And the, uh, the Lord Chamberlain had demanded cuts in the text before they would agree to having it run. What then happened was the company ignored it because they were in rum corn, you know, and they didn't think. And then people from the Lord Chamberlain's office were in the audience and the play was stopped in the middle of the play because they'd been actually, you know, using words that should have been thrown out. <laughs> but 
the abolition of all of that meant a huge liberation. It did mean that, in fact, people could start then devising plays and to write plays that didn't have some the state sitting on their shoulder deciding what, in fact, you could or could not do. And politically, it was a huge opener. And then, of course, later through the 70s, what you've got in terms of, of a lot of um, uh, theatre was that whereas you've always had uh, theatres in each town, you know, local, lots of local theatres, which were receiving houses very often. They were not necessarily uh, places where, in fact, the plays were being directed and rehearsed, but they would just come in as, as a, a, a set play. But you also then started to get some um, companies which were being funded through the Arts Council, and that came later, where you ended up having money directed out through the Arts Council to support local initiatives and things. And with somebody like Peter, I mean, what happened to him, his trajectory was that because he was so interested in the idea of, of pairing back more and more from a, uh, a production, in the 19, I think it was the uh, early 70s, he moved to Paris and he decided he was wanting to work with actors from lots of different cultures and lots of different language backgrounds. And it was amazing. I mean, he had a, a Japanese actor who was with him for something like 30 years and uh, an African actor, and I can't remember which state he was from. I don't think it was Mali. Again, somebody who was absolute pinnacle for Peter's company. So what had happened after being the sort of darling of the West End and part of the whole um, almost caravan of uh, what, in fact, the big you know, producers were wanting to put on. Um, it was one of those things where you just knew that um, he, was, he was then more and more interested in, in trying to work with people to see how, in fact, you could communicate with very different types of audiences, not a West End audience. He and his company travel through parts of Africa and parts of Asia, performing in villages where people had never seen a theatre group before. And what they were trying to do is to, to devise ways of communicating stories. And it's, uh, <clears throat> it was it's something that, was hugely, hugely important for him that he ended up getting a little uh, theatre in northeast Paris called the Bout du Nord. And he was amazing in that. I mean, it ended up being an empty space a lot of the time. The stage was just a bare stage with a carpet and sometimes with a musician, often not. And he would be working with them. And one of the plays that I saw there which I was amazed by, was watching Adrian Lester play Hamlet. And what uh, Peter had done was he'd worked with Adrian for something like three months rehearsing with him. And essentially he'd cut almost most of Hamlet away so that you were just concentrating on Hamlet himself. So the other characters were in and out, but were much, and it was almost like, I keep thinking that he called the play, What is a Man? But you don't think he did, he called it Hamlet. But it was, you watched a man on stage and it because of the reduction in everything else, you were concentrating on just what the motivation of this one man was from the beginning to the end. And I think that's something that he was more and more wanting to do, was to pair away excess and, and things almost got in the way of looking at something that was immensely simple, which isn't simple, but it looked simple because, you know, that's what that the sort of the, the product of it. I mean, he was he was very interesting to talk to because you always felt 
that he was he was sort of listening to your words and thinking about what you were saying and would respond immensely quietly, very slowly, very often, um, and picking up ideas. And, and if he disagreed with things, always wanting to make other points, it was always with, with great emphasis uh, that, you know, he's, he was still thinking about what you'd been saying, but was countering it in other ways. And clearly for actors who worked with him, I mean, it was a completely different experience than most companies have. And he, interestingly, he said, when he'd gone back to do some work at the RSC one year, uh, and he worked there previously, he said he was very shocked at how lax at times actors have become in terms of things like rehearsal. He was immensely disciplined. I mean, and you felt that about he himself, you know, there was a rigor about timing. There was a rigor about thinking. There was a, a joy as well about, you know, being excited by things, but, but you felt that there was, he, it was a hugely serious project was living and being a theater person. And, uh, I mean, he, he was, his influence clearly on theatre was one that I can't think of any other director in Britain who's had the same sort of impact as he's had in the last sort of 50, 60 years. Mm -hmm. Completely different to somebody like Peter Hall. I mean, the one thing about Peter Brook was that you felt he was, he was almost always on stage with the actors. People like Peter Hall would be, yes, with the actors when they're uh, rehearsing and things, but almost separated from performances and things. And you never felt that he was there as, you know, almost willing them on, which is what we felt Peter was doing a lot of the time. It, it, it strikes me as well, you know, when you talk about the things in the 60s with Marat Saad, and obviously mm -hmm. Marat was the leader of the, French Revolution and um, or about the Vietnam War and this sort of big radicalization about that. Do you think he took inspiration from some of the earlier kind of alternative uh, dramatists? You know, if you think about Brecht or if you think about Clifford Odets Ode that you you referred yeah. to, or the Russian Revolution, where obviously you got very radical theatre. You don't think he was in that tradition? Was that that was more a tradition maybe of the agitprop groups? Yeah, no, groups exactly. Like I, no, I I think I mean I suppose the Russian that he related to is Marhold, who was actually working before and after the revolution, and but he I mean he he clearly recognised Brecht's importance, but he was never I think attracted to a theatre like Brecht, partly because and that's I think his. You, <laughs> there were times when you felt that he was almost, you know, mystical in terms of his relationship to the world. I mean, he, he was a follower of Gurdjieff, somebody that I would never had any interest in knowing about or pursuing or anything. So there was always for him a sort of an idea that you didn't, you were not taking a position and propagandizing a position. Whereas people like, Brecht and Odette and others had very clear ideas about how they wanted societies changed. And I think, you know, Brooke would never have been in that position ever. He always, you know, took a, a sort of back step on it and, and wanting to, to talk about what theatre is rather than what society is. You know, it's, it's that that you felt a lot of the time. And he was... I mean, he was, he was very, I think he was always very cautious to identify where he stood on social and political issues, except, except on the question of race. And his company, which started in the 70s, uh, was one where in fact the question of international relations between actors from all different cultures was hugely, hugely important for him. It was, it was almost like wanting to, to learn from different cultural groups and, and, and a recognition 
that we are all the human race in a sense you know I mean it's uh, so it wasn't quite humanism but it was a it was very interesting that he he did produce one of the very first you know multiracial companies and and sustained that always with a huge acknowledgement he did a lot of work with South African actors with mm. Japanese actors with you know he's he's I mean it it, it was a a very different way of thinking about the world from you know you or me because it was somehow distilling down what what precisely this thing is that we are very very attracted to which is a way of exploring stories and ideas in the air in front of you at this moment and that's one of the things, I, it's funny because just before I started talking to her, I suddenly realized that of course, YouTube does have things like ma uh, extracts from the Mar Assad on it. And yes, it is, but that's a bit like, that's just the film. It's not the production. And we all know that a very good theater production is something that you don't replicate even the next night, you know. They are, they are different and they, and times they are completely electric. And other times they're not, and it's, it's the, I mean, it's it's very intriguing about how how you think about it like that. It's true because, like you say, I mean, you can go to a perfectly decent production and you feel it's quite sort of flat sometimes, and yet other times, and it, it obviously is not just the quality of the acting and the directing, but the whole experience and how how the audience relates to it and how the audience is involved in it and mm -hmm. whether they feel they're they're part of it at all so yeah I th how do you think he he or what did he feel about things like agitprop theatre do you think that played a part in trying to explain theatre or was he less keen on that I think he was less keen on it I mean it's almost it would be for him I think um too crude you know, he would he would want to be working on something for much longer, and um, and I think I think yes, the idea of sloganizing or or putting forward a position that doesn't have the complexity of the you know forcing a sort of uh, a questioning a curiosity about something. And I think, and that was true with so much agit prop, what it was actually, you know, it was the, the way of carrying a message. Um, yeah. And I don't think for him that was, and he wasn't interested in that at all. Um, I think, I think the, the thing that for him, the person for him, who was the most important person in theater was Shakespeare. Mm. He thought, I mean, he, he just acknowledged the, the huge power, both of storytelling, but of the development of language and of how you devise ways of, you know, almost setting up things that are curious within a play. Just a kind of final point, I suppose, is, is really where you think his legacy leaves theatre now. I mean, it's very interesting when you say about Hamlet because presumably what he was trying to do was in a way give a kind of psychological profile of Hamlet by stripping out all the you know the grave diggers and all the other bits that I think the grave diggers might are. have been in there you know there's a sort well, of maybe, a light maybe. touch at the end but yeah but you know that he's trying to sort of hone in on all of these kind of things it seems to me that although there's still a great deal of very interesting theatre going on I think we have lost something over the last I don't know decades I suppose in terms of partly that theatre has become another sort of neoliberal commodity and that you know there's this whole kind of sense that it's something that you do along with you know along with various other things that you spend large amounts of money buying tickets for and I don't know whether that excludes people obviously people on lower incomes I know there are lots of efforts for example at the national to put on plays that will introduce theatre to black audiences for example like small island and those sorts of things which I think have been quite successful but obviously if you look at actors 
people talk now about the different social class that many actors come mm -hmm. from now that you have to you have to have gone to private school to get a decent shot at doing drama in most schools these days and that's a very different thing from certainly I think the 60s and 70s where you did have much more opening up of things so well, you, how do you think, think it looks now I, I think it looks pretty grim at times mm. um but but I say that um I think one of the things that he was asked is how you in, how you get more people to come to the theatre and he said you uh lower the price of admission. I mean, for him, it almost should have been something that people, you know, could just come to, you know, without. Um, and he was always very clear about that. He didn't believe it should be this sort of money-making enterprise it is. West End prices now are so prohibitive that the only people who can go are the cushioned middle class, without question, and they're the ones who discuss it. On the other hand, I think, I think there are attempts um, to make to get more audiences in. You're right about what happens with drama schools now. At one time, people could uh, have a grant to go to drama school. You can't any longer, of course. Um, and and there are occasional bursaries, but people are very worried about the middle class intake into drama schools, and that's and you hear it all the time when you go into uh, theatres and, and realise who's on the stage. But the, the other thing is, and I think this is the hardest thing actually, Lindsay, is that you feel that there's also a way of viewing theatre now, which is um, white men wrote these plays and they're not as important as the experiences of, you know, black or ethnic minority people. And, and I just think, for me, and I feel this very much about novels too, that there is a real difficulty at times about actually being able to see what is really of worth. And sometimes it's time, you know, that becomes a sieve to be able to see. And I think, you know, people like Chekhov, or Strindberg, you know, Ibsen, they were hugely important, not just at their time, but the sort of issues that they were trying to, to grapple with are still important. And I, I would be really, really sorry to see the demise of classical mm. theatre plays, you know, even though they were dominated very largely by men uh, mm. in terms of the dramatists. Um, but on the other hand, you you know, one also hopes, and, and again, this is going to be very difficult at this time. We know what's going to be happening with local authorities. We know what's going to happen with Arts Council funding. These are going to be pared down and pared down. And all small theatres are running right up against whether in fact they can sustain their ability to be able to put anything on and to keep running. And also, of course, then the whole thing about what happens with people who are out of work actors, you know. I mean, it's, uh, I just feel that at one time you could go on the dole, you know, when you were an actor, there was the dole. So if you weren't being employed as an actor, you could at least be sustained. Now, none of that applies. And I know that that's true of almost all areas of life, but it is something that you just feel that the sort of things that theatre skills should be, somehow you know sustained in some way and of course it's not going to be it's going to be we're as ruthlessly under the axe as anybody everywhere else uh so i'm not feeling too hopeful lindsay about you know the next period in terms of it on the other hand i do think whatever happens brooks legacy in terms of some of the ways that he was thinking about theater and certainly some of the, well, I mean, you know, he he was a filmmaker as well. I mean, uh, the uh, they are there, they're, and they're there on YouTube, some of his productions, and they're really worth looking at. And people who he had around them, like Adrian and, and others, were people who, in fact, had a real resonance in terms of the enjoyment of, of theatre as well. And that's something that I think was, was, again, an important thing about him.
Well, that's a very good way to end it, I think, that, uh, you know, if you're interested in what Jane's been telling us about Peter Brook, then go and check out some of the, the things on YouTube. There's loads and loads. I think Marat Saad is a really, really mm. excellent film. Not obviously, it can't replicate completely the original theatre experience, but it's a tremendous film to look at. There's lots of other ones. So thanks very much, Jane Chalice, for doing the interview and thanks for watching. Thanks, Sweet.